Hey, do you want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here is how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or your computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating right now. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take your conversation with your fans to the next level, Q&A and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. I've hosted my podcast on Spotify for Podcasters since day one, so I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started today. Childhood trauma doesn't look like just one thing. There's a large range of traumatic events or trauma types that children can be exposed to. And what feels traumatic to one child may not be traumatic to another. What is going on, beautiful people? You are listening to the Affirmations for Black Girls podcast, where we focus on personal growth and cultivating a healthy relationship with ourselves. I am your host, Tyra the Creative, actress, content creator, and mental health enthusiast. You guys, we are on week five of our childhood trauma series. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to the previous episodes before this one for an overview of what childhood trauma is, how it impacts the Black community, and what my experiences with it are. In today's episode, we are diving into the different types of childhood trauma and how it affects people. And as I've been saying, if you are not in a place where you feel it will be beneficial for you to hear about trauma today, feel free to skip this episode. My goal with this series is to remind every single one of you listening that you are loved and you are not alone no matter what you've gone through. So with that being said, let's jump into our affirmation of the week. This week's affirmation is, I acknowledge and accept that healing is possible. Ooh, that one hit me right in the heart. Let's drop in, you guys. I acknowledge and accept that healing is possible. 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 Let's drop in and say it one last time together. I acknowledge and accept that healing is possible. Oh, you guys, the first time saying that affirmation really convicted me. It is so powerful. It is so easy to lose hope and think, when will I ever recover from this? After we've been through something traumatic, it can start to feel like healing isn't possible because it can be your traumatic experience can feel so dark and so heavy, especially if we don't fully understand what we've been through. We can start to be hard on ourselves, blame ourselves, or just feel like maybe we're, we're making a big deal out of nothing. Y'all, I'm here to tell you, you are not making too big a deal out of anything. Whatever happened to you was not your fault and you can learn to heal no matter how deep and heavy or hard it can be. 
it is possible. So for me, one of those things that have helped me most in healing was educating myself and learning more about the experiences I've gone through and realizing that so many other people have been through similar things and also taking inventory of what they did that worked for them to help them overcome their trauma and just try different things out to bring myself to the other side of that trauma, to truly heal myself. None of us are alone in the trauma we have experienced. Remember that. In today's episode, I want to dive a little bit deeper into exactly what childhood trauma can look like. This is super important to me for a couple of reasons. First, like I said, learning more about childhood trauma was super helpful for me on my healing journey. And I don't want you guys to think that my healing journey has ended. I am still healing each and every day. Just like I mentioned in the last episode about my birthday blues, You can always uncover more things about your traumatic experiences through future life experiences. But the second reason this is super important to me is because I don't want any of you guys out there listening to feel like your experiences don't matter. And what I went through may be different than what you've gone through, but there are some common types of childhood trauma that many of us have endured. So I want to cover those very briefly and share my personal experiences with some of them. The first type of childhood trauma I want to touch on is bullying. And in my personal experience, I, and this may, this is not like proven fact, but In my personal experience, I would say that bullying is huge. I would say it is one of the most common types of childhood trauma that affects many communities, no matter what color you are, um, no matter what part of your childhood you're in. Um, But bullying can severely affect a child's or a teen's self-image, social interactions, or even your school performance. And it can also lead to some mental health problems. So... If you're not really familiar with bullying, bullying is when, well, in this sense, um, when one child or a group of children or even adults, when one party picks on another party, makes fun of that person or treats them negatively. And I was bullied when I was growing up. And when I was growing up, and I I feel like a few of y'all could probably attest to this, everything that is considered bullying today was not considered bullying when I was growing up. So being that the things I experienced didn't necessarily have the title bullying, I didn't know what to do with how I felt because I felt that it was normal. And when I think about that today, it's just like, oh my gosh, I just really wish I had someone there to lay a seed or to step in and say something. And I don't want to say like my family or anything, my my parents saw me being bullied and I didn't say anything. But what I am saying is I was bullied in a way where my parents didn't either didn't consider it bullying or they weren't around to stick up for me. And I also did not share these experiences with them. I was a very closed off child. I didn't share things that made me upset or though anything like that. I really, when I was growing up, I really wanted to be as small as possible. I didn't want to cause any additional trouble because my home life wasn't the greatest in terms of my mom and dad fought a lot. Um, when they were married, they did eventually get a divorce and I just didn't want to add fuel to the fire. And in this situation of being bullied, I wasn't really bullied at school. Everyone, was pretty pleasant towards me, but I was mainly bullied when I would go to my grandma's house after school. And it wasn't considered bullying, but back then, but it was name calling. And one thing that I used to be called a lot when I was young was black. And now I love my black skin, y'all, but it took a lot of retraining my brain. It really did. I am a dark skinned girl and I've always been dark skinned and I was also a little on the chunky side growing up. So I got called a mixture of black and big mama. 
And it wasn't necessarily that my family said it, you're so black, you're ugly. Like they didn't say anything like that, but I didn't like being called that. I just, it just didn't sit well with me. And it, what I heard was you're too dark and they didn't necessarily say that, but that is a form of bullying. Even if you aren't intentionally bullying someone that was name calling because I have a name. You can call me by my name and also being called big mama. And that's also something that like my daddy called me and I eventually told him, Hey, I don't like being called that. And he stopped. So I'm glad that I did do that because he didn't consider that. He just considered it like a, an affectionate term. And I'm also from the South. So that kind of stuff can be a little sticky, but I was also called big mama and I didn't like that, you know? So those are my experiences with bullying. And I also want to point out my goddaughter. Um, the other, like a week ago, my aunt called me, which is my goddaughter's grandmother. And she was like, hey, do you know this person? It's like, no, I don't know who that is. Why? And she was like, well, her daughter has been bullying Mariah. And y'all, I immediately got infuriated. And I was just like, what is going on? Like what is happening? Because this is so serious, especially in this day and age, age, children can be so cruel. And even if they aren't intentionally being cruel, we are so impressionable at those ages that any small thing like that, especially when I have kids, I am going to treat it as if it is the most important thing in the world. I'm going to treat it like somebody just committed murder. Like, and I, and, and that's what I mean is I don't want to be a mom who just says, oh, brush it off. No, because everything affects people differently. Even if it's something that I don't personally feel is super big, you never know how much that is affecting that child. So, um, they're getting this situation resolved and it just really, makes me want to just hug Mariah even more and just ask her, you know, what she's going through because bullying can affect your entire self image. And something else that I noticed about her when she was here was, um, one time she said she was too fat. Mariah is seven years old. And I was just like, Mariah, well, this is, this is what I did. I'm not a mom. And I just used the tools that I have personally I just tried to reinforce positive affirmations. I said, Mariah, you are beautiful. You are not fat, girl. You is fine. What are you talking about? And like, we just had like a little conversation and she just started to giggle. And sometimes it's, that's all it takes is something as simple as repeating those affirmations to a child so they can have that in their toolbox when someone is saying something to them. And pay attention to what kids are saying because they will repeat the bullying, or if they're going through this type of trauma, they will repeat that at some point. And I personally believe that it is super important to catch it early because it can take years and years of unlearning to heal yourself from this type of bullying. The next one I want to touch on is natural disasters. So this can definitely be a form of childhood trauma. And a natural disaster like hurricane, flood, earthquake, those types of things can lead to many adversities for children and families, including displacement, loss of your home or your personal property, changing schools, economic hardships, loss of the community and social support that you once had, and even injury and death of loved ones. And I didn't, I don't even know how to like say this because I do not want to, I know my experience isn't the same as others, but I experienced this a little with Hurricane Katrina. I grew up in a place called St. Francisville, Louisiana, and we were also affected by the storm. And before I get into that, if you have not seen the documentary Katrina Babies, I highly, highly, highly recommend you take, oh, you watch it. It's on HBO and it just talks about the children and how they were forgotten in terms of checking up on them and seeing how they're doing. And if you haven't heard of Hurricane Katrina, it was a, it was a hurricane that hit Louisiana in 2005. I was in the fifth grade when it are going to the fifth grade when it happened. And 
the levees broke in New Orleans and New Orleans flooded. People had to evacuate. Lots of people never went back home. Um, we got an influx of students in my school in St. Francisville, and a lot of people moved elsewhere in Dallas, Houston, those areas. And it was a huge deal for me as well because I was in the fifth grade, you know, and it started out being okay. Like, oh, okay, it's a hurricane, but we were without power for two weeks. We ate MREs. Um, it was hot. Louisiana is very hot and humid, and especially after a hurricane, if you ever um, experienced a hurricane, it's very hot and sticky and humid after. And this hurricane happened in August, so there were a lot of these bugs called, we call them lug bugs, but I think they're called love bugs. And there are these little black bugs that stick together. You pull them apart. They're little skinny bugs with like orange on their face. And they were everywhere. They were all in the house and everything. And it was traumatic for me in a sense of we didn't have, we didn't have <laughs> any AC, any, any lights for two weeks. And I also didn't know what was going on. I'm in fifth grade. I don't know when this is going to end. Um, and on the flip side of that, we had to do things a little differently because all of these people from New Orleans got displaced. So I just remember my parents being a lot more cautious in our small town because uh, on the news, they were saying, make sure that you actually lock your doors and stuff. Because living in a town like I lived in, we didn't necessarily lock our doors. Like I live in a small little country town. Ain't nobody coming in your house. So we, I remember my daddy went to Home Depot and he got like this wooden dowel because we had a, um, a sliding glass door that if you hit it the right way, it would just pop open unlocked. And I saw him putting that there one night and I was like, why are you putting that there? And he was like, because we don't want anybody to break in. There's been, there's been an increase in break-ins and things happening. We were under curfew. I don't even remember how long we were under curfew, but we were under curfew for a long time. Our school day got um, lengthened once we actually did go back to school because we had missed so much school because of the hurricane. And it was just, it just felt like the twilight zone for me, even though I was blessed to not lose any family members and not um, lose my home. We started, we lived differently. And I remember ever since then, when my daddy told me about why we had the dial rod and I would always see him making sure that he carried his gun and all that, it just opened my eyes to a world of danger. And I started to have a little bit of anxiety. I started to worry. And I never shared any of that with my parents because remember as a child, I wanted to be as small as possible in a sense of not adding fuel to the fire, not being hard to deal with, not being a burden. And I just kept all that stuff to myself. And even when I think about Hurricane Katrina today, I'm just like, wow, like that. We really did live through that. There was, there was times where um, like my mom and dad, they fought during that time and my daddy would just leave the house and it would just be us. And I would just be, oh my gosh, Oof, it just hit me. Like I would just be so terrified because I didn't know what was going to happen. And it's just, even though I, I wasn't in New Orleans when this happened and so many people lost so much more than, than I ever could have imagined, this affected me as well as a child. And watching the documentary, Katrina Babies, just made me realize, wow, like, Nobody ever asked me if I was okay either during that time. And just thinking about it right now is just like, I'm, I'm grateful that I got through it, but it's always a good idea to check in with yourself. Or if you are a parent, check in with your children, even if it don't look like they necessarily going through anything, because you, you never know how they are processing things. It's super important to talk to your kids. So in a nutshell, natural disasters. Let's move on to the next one. Um, domestic violence and physical abuse. So this can be anything. This can give you anything from like 
anxiety, nightmares, increased aggression, emotional and behavioral issues, difficulty maintaining friendships, distrust in authority figures, low self-worth, and aggression in acting out are very, very common in these situations. And I think a lot of teachers are like they're briefed to know things like this to share when kids are acting out in this way um, with like the principal or authorities and things to help kids, which is I which I think is amazing. But they're very, very common um, side effects or results. I don't even know the word I'm looking for, y'all, but they are very common things to happen when kids are experiencing domestic violence and physical abuse trauma. But there are a wide range of reactions and they can be they can honestly range like the list you you can't even get through the whole list because you never know how people are going to react but some abused children become anxious and fearful while others can become very numb and withdrawn next we're going to touch on really quickly sexual abuse which is another form of childhood trauma So children who have been sexually abused may display a range of emotional and behavioral reactions, including an increase in nightmares and or other sleeping difficulties. They can withdraw or like have a withdrawn behavior, maybe angry outbursts, anxiety, depression, or sexual knowledge, language, and behaviors that are inappropriate for that child's age. And while I haven't... um, I haven't personally experienced either domestic violence, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. I did have one listener reach out and ask if we would speak on this. So I responded to her by saying we would touch on it, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not equipped to really speak on anything um, in depth about sexual abuse, but I did find this website. It's called helpguide.org. And this is a it's the title of it is recovering from rape and sexual trauma. And I will, I'm going to read a little bit into it because I know that this is so common in our community, in the black community. And I just want to give what I can give on this. So recovering from sexual trauma, step one, open up about what happened to you. Now I know as a child, this can be, you know, super hard, but now that If you're watching this or if you're listening to this podcast and you have dealt with this, try opening up. I know something that was very hard for me was I had this this icky feeling when I wanted to open up to my therapist. But I said, you know what? I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to blurt it out. I'm just going to go through it. I'm just going to rip that bandaid off. And that is what I personally had to do to talk about my personal childhood trauma. I just I felt so while I was doing it but as soon as I opened up and said everything and it was all on the table it was this weight lifted off of my shoulder so this person this website says open up about what happened to you and you can do that by reaching out to someone you trust it's common to think that if you don't talk about what happened to you it didn't really happen but you can't heal when you are avoiding the truth So if you do find yourself in a situation where you're like, I can't talk about it, just repeat that self to you. Just repeat that to yourself until you believe it. You cannot heal when you're avoiding the truth. You can also challenge your sense of helplessness and isolation. Trauma leaves you feeling powerless and vulnerable. And it's important to remind yourself that you have strengths and coping skills that can get you through the tough times. And one of the best ways to reclaim your sense of power is by helping others. So you can volunteer your time, give blood, reach out to a friend who is in need or donate to your favorite charity. Then you can also consider joining a support group for other sexual abuse survivors. Support groups can help you feel less isolated and alone. They also provide invaluable information on how to cope with symptoms and work towards recovery. And if you can't find a support group in your area, you can always look online because there are tons of them. So I wanted to touch on that because I think For me personally, that was the biggest step, opening up about what happened to me, my childhood trauma. And once I did open up, I then created room to receive the resources and receive the help from my therapist. And I opened up a space to actually give myself space to cope 
with my symptoms and learn how to heal. I started researching how to heal. So I think those are the most important things. The listener who reached out to me said she feels like she can't talk about it. You can't heal when you are avoiding the truth. And it may feel sticky, icky, heavy, shameful, but rip that band-aid off. Whenever you're ready, it may take time. I know it took me forever, feels like, but I finally ripped that band-aid off and it just felt like Girl, I felt like I lost 15 pounds. Okay. And the last type of childhood trauma that we're going to touch on, and it may be more, um, I feel like this type of stuff is always, like the research is always growing. But this type of childhood trauma, that the last one that we're going to touch on is grief and experiencing a death. While many children can adjust very well after death, Some children have ongoing difficulties that interfere with everyday life and make it difficult to recall positive memories of their loved ones. A child may have a traumatic reaction after a death that was sudden and unexpected, like through violence or an accident, or a death that was anticipated, like cancer, an illness of some sort. If the child's responses are severe or prolonged and interfere with his or her functioning, the child may be experiencing childhood traumatic grief. I haven't experienced any um, traumatic grief, I don't think, not to an extreme extent, but I will say I definitely was closed off after one of my uncles passed away back in 2007. One of my favorite great uncles, my my daddy's mom's brother, his name is Edward, my uncle Edward. Um, and I, I, I think I've talked about him on the podcast before y'all, but he, we went to church together. So I would see him every Sunday and he was one of the first people to always feed me words of affirmation. He would always tell me how beautiful I was. He would, he would say, you're a beautiful black girl, beautiful black girl. And when I was called black in that way, I didn't think, you know, I didn't say, oh my gosh, I'm too dark. Um, but he would always say that. And it just made me feel so good because there weren't many people telling me that. And I remember the day before he passed away, he came to my grandmother's house. And I don't know, I was a teenager or uh, what was I, seventh grade, preteen, 12, 13? I don't even know y'all, but I was young. And I don't know what he said, but it kind of frustrated me. I don't even know y'all. Like it was, I was just being a child and I said bye to him. And then the next time I I went to my other grandmother's house and my papa said, "Uh, what happened to your uncle Edward? And I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, he passed away today and my heart was just in my feet and I don't know why I'm so emotional today y'all my gosh um I just it just really hurt me that that was my last emotion towards him when he had always been like just he just he has just always been such a light in my life and fed me so many affirmations like I just so anyways um I went to his funeral and I was just stoic and I just I didn't cry or anything and then for like two years after that I had so many dreams I remember I don't know what show it was but I was watching some like 90s show, maybe, was it Sister Sister? Was it Fresh Prince? I don't know. They were at a funeral or something. And it just brought me back to that day. And I just bawled my eyes out. And it was such a release, but I do feel that I just held on to that because I felt so guilty for being, you know, upset in that moment when, and when I was thinking about it, I don't remember what happened to this day, but at the moment I was like, why was I upset about that? Why, why didn't I give him a hug? You know, because I typically, anytime I saw him, I would always give him a hug when he would leave. And I didn't that time. And I was just like, I was just so mad at myself, but 
I know that everything happens for a reason and I have since forgiven myself. But even though um, I guess you could kind of call that a little bit of traumatic grief, but I think that was, um, it was, uh, what am I trying to say? It was set in motion because of that last experience. And it was sudden. He had, my uncle died from a heart attack. Um, so all I'm saying is that has taught me to realize that life is precious and I try not to hold grudges. And, you know, if things are frivolous, I try to make sure that I am regulating myself to not hold on to things because you never know what can happen. Um, and actually I do have another, I don't want to stick on, on death too long or grief too long, you guys, but I do have another experience that I would love to share and I'm not going to cry. Okay. So something that I have been working on now is not being anxious when I receive phone calls from my mom or my dad late at night, because back in what year is that? 2018, I got a call from my mom, um, saying that my cousin was murdered and he was 27 at the time. And we were close when we were kids, but since I moved out to LA and all of that kind of stuff, we had kind of lost touch. I was seeing for family holidays and stuff. But the the kicker to this is that literally y'all less than an hour before I received the phone call from my mom, he wrote me on Facebook and I was doing something on my computer and I was like, oh, he, uh, Tavares wrote me. I'll respond in a second. And I, I, I had all every intention to respond. And then I got the call from my mom and I, I had that same feeling that I had back in 2007 when my uncle passed away. And for a long time after that, I just, I would just get so anxious whenever I would receive a call late at night or anything. And I talked to my therapist about it and she was like, this is normal, but you need to have a conversation with your, your parents. So I had a conversation with them and I was like, Hey, if you call me, I mean, like, don't call me late at night to be honest, because I'm also two hours behind them. And I remember one time my mama called me, it was like 10 something my time. So that's midnight, her time. So my heart immediately dropped. I looked at the, at the phone for like five seconds before I answered and she was just calling. She was just, just getting home from like a game or something she went to in New Orleans. And I just sat there and like laughed in relief. But I do think that these experiences can be a little traumatic. So I, I urge you to take some inventory and reflect and and reflect on if something like this has happened, because this is also something that you need to heal from. So it's something that I'm working on. I still get that little drop in my heart when I get a call from my, my dad late at night, but he drives all times of night. So now I know I say to myself, Tyra, everything is fine. Your daddy is gonna, uh, he is driving home and all that kind of stuff, but I am working on it every single day of my life. So y'all know I am all about self-care. One of my favorite self-care activities is meditation. I've been using a meditation and sleep app called Calm that I think you guys would really like. I mean, I've talked about it on the podcast a few times and I personally love the sleep stories. They're the perfect way to wind down and drift off to sleep after a long day. And to be honest, I recommend the ones that are actually for kids the most because they have the fun voices, music, and sound effects. I want to help you experience the joy meditation brings to my life. So I'm giving you a seven day free trial of the app. Head to the link in the show notes to check out the Calm app and prepare to be more calm on a daily basis. You may be thinking, Tyra, I relate to multiple or even all of the examples of trauma you gave. Is there something wrong with me that I experienced so much trauma in my childhood? Y'all, absolutely not. As I just shared, I also had multiple different traumatic experiences throughout my life, and I even realized one while recording this podcast. 
And we are not alone in this. There's even a term for it. It's called childhood traumatic stress. And I'll be honest, I hadn't even heard of this before starting, before I started learning more about childhood trauma. But as soon as I learned about it, I felt like a weight was lifted from my shoulders. There's a term for what I've experienced and I'm not alone. Childhood traumatic stress basically means we've experienced one or more of these traumas over the course of our lives. And we developed reactions, what I just talked about, that continue to impact our daily life, even after we are no longer in the traumatic experience or exposed to the trauma on a daily basis. So if y'all experienced bullying like I did, you may have noticed feeling anxious in new social environments. For example, because you were used to social environments not feeling safe for you. Or like I just said, maybe you received a not so pleasant phone call in the past and it led to a traumatic experience. And now when you receive a certain type of phone call, your heart stops or it drops or you just feel super anxious. And that is totally normal. So even if you're no longer being bullied or in those situations, you still had an emotional response that were caused by that past trauma. Like I said, it's totally normal and it is valid. That I, I would say that that is a key to look into what's going on. Um, because that's exactly what I did when I started receiving phone calls after 2018 when I got the phone call from my mom. I started to reflect on when I would feel this way and I, I brought it to my therapist's attention. A lot of people develop depression, anxiety, changes in mood and behavior and problems forming attachments to others. I know for myself, my trauma caused me to one, be super anxious around uh, phone calls, well, with phone calls around like midnight, nighttime for my parents because they are two hours ahead and my childhood trauma that is connected to my parents getting a divorce has also changed my attachment style. Or when I was younger, my attachment style was different. I'm working on it now, but I had a very anxious attachment style and I had abandonment issues. I always felt like I had to stay in certain friendships, relationships, because I would feel guilty if I left because I didn't want them to feel like they were unloved or that I hated them because that probably wasn't the case. And for a long, for the longest time, I didn't realize that it was actually connected to my trauma. And I would love to do a series on attachment styles pretty soon. So if you guys would like something like that, let me send me an email. Let me know on Instagram, the Twitter page, whatever. If you guys would like to see something like that. Okay, so I know that I'm throwing a lot of new information at y'all and this stuff is not easy to process. So let's take a second to take a few deep breaths. You can go get you a drink or a snack if you need to. I have a little root beer right here that I'm sipping on and check in with yourself and maybe even take a second to repeat the affirmation of the week again, which is I acknowledge and accept that healing is possible. So if you need to take a break, go ahead and pause here now. But if not, we're going to keep moving forward. So y'all know me and I know you didn't think I was going to end this episode without giving you some tips and tools for healing and moving forward once you've realized you've experienced childhood trauma and maybe also traumatic stress. So here are a couple of things that have helped me. Number one. Therapy. Y'all, I cannot say this enough. I cannot say enough good things about therapy. Therapy is amazing. I feel like therapy is the best wellness practice and I feel like everybody should have a therapist. I don't feel like therapy should be a luxury in life, meaning I feel like everyone, no matter your tax bracket, no matter how you live, I feel like therapy should be something that is um, something that you indulge in. And so I'll be talking about there talking more about therapy in the next episode. But as I always say, better help is a great option. This is not sponsored in any way. But that's how I found my first therapist. And you can you do a survey at the beginning to 
say what you're in therapy for. If you're going to be in therapy by yourself, maybe family therapy or couples therapy. And then you can even specify if you want a faith-based counselor or if it doesn't matter, man, woman, whatever. And you can also say, how you prefer therapy, whether that is video calls or just phone calls. BetterHelp is completely online, completely digital. So you can start therapy literally at the click of a button. So I have, I've linked it down below in the show notes to, for you guys to go and try out BetterHelp if you want. As I said, this is not sponsored, so I don't have a discount code for you. But what my biggest win of this week is that my daddy just signed up for better help y'all and I'm super excited for him to begin this therapy journey. He was in the military so he does have a lot of trauma from being in the military so I cannot wait for his personal development and growth. The second thing that has helped me with managing my negative effects of childhood trauma is focusing on self-love and self-care. The more we love ourselves and take care of ourselves, the easier it is to heal from the past. So remind yourself that you are worthy of love no matter what you have been through, you guys, and take time to really care for yourself the way you wish you would have been taken care of during your traumatic childhood situations. I know that's something that I say to myself all the time. I want to be who I needed when I was a child. That is super important for me. And that's the driving fact, one of the driving factors behind me starting this podcast, because I wish I had a resource like this when I was growing up. And that leads me to my third thing, which is inner child work. You guys, I can do a whole episode. Matter of fact, I could do a whole series. I could do a whole series on a lot of stuff, but I could do a whole series on healing your inner child and what that looks like but there's way too much to get into now but I highly recommend you do some research and start not only taking care of and loving yourself now but also take care of and love your inner child because I mentioned this in a previous episode um, or maybe I didn't maybe I just saw this on TikTok I don't I don't even remember but we are one years old We are 15 years old. We are still that 20 year old and I'm still that 26 year old. I'm still that 27 year old. I'm just 28 now. And that's important to note because depending on a certain situation, the three year old version of yourself can show up. The 16 year old version of yourself that endured that childhood trauma can peek through again if it is triggered. And that's super important. That's why inner child work is super important. So you can love on those parts of you because you will always and forever be that child. And it's your job now as an adult or as being older than what you were in the past to do whatever it takes to heal yourself so you can live a a healed and, and a full life. Okay, you have made it through another intense and emotional and vulnerable episode of the Childhood Trauma Series. So I want you guys to take a second and tell yourself how proud you are of yourself for taking steps toward your healing, even if it's just by listening to my experiences on this podcast, because even small actions like listening to a podcast can make a huge difference and it can promote change. It can influence change change. So I know for myself, I didn't realize all of the experiences I talked about in this episode counted as trauma until I spent some time reflecting on them and learning more about childhood trauma. You may say to yourself, oh my God, that's trauma. What? In in my community, it's just considered normal. And from bullying to natural disasters, the experiences I had in my childhood have really shaped who I am today. But It took work on my part to get to the place I'm in now where I can talk about these things and not cry my eyes out, even though I cry a little bit and happily say they no longer impact me on the daily. Like they don't take me completely back to that first experience, that first traumatic experience. But if you're not quite there yet, do not worry. Like our affirmation says, you have to acknowledge and accept that healing is possible before it will ever happen. And healing is a journey, not a destination. (laughs) 
Uh oh, you guys, you know what time it is. It is time for our fun closing segment. So, we've spent a lot of time talking about the negative parts of childhood. So, I thought I'd lighten the mood for a second and do a segment that I call What Was I Thinking? I have not done this in a while, but this is a segment where I share something that I did years ago when I was a child, when I was a preteen, that I feel like what what was I doing Tyra like what was you doing so I don't want to do this alone I want y'all to do it with me so y'all dm me or email me and share your funniest childhood memories and I would love to share them in a future episode so what was I thinking okay let's start with the first one this one I'm gonna call I'm gonna do two y'all I don't know what I was thinking but when I was in high school, my favorite go-to hairstyle, like when I say y'all, I thought I was on and popping, was the side ponytail, okay? And I know when I when I was in school, the side ponytail was cool, but like when I say I played it out, I played it out. I wore a side ponytail to everything. I wore a side ponytail to church. I wore a side ponytail to school. I wore a side ponytail in basketball games. I was on the basketball team. And as I look back at that, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, what were we all thinking wearing a side ponytail like that? Like, we just ain't wanted to be in the back? Like, what's going on? And my second, what was I thinking that I want to talk about today was, y'all, so... You know, (laughs) this is hilarious. Back in the day, there was a show called Borny. I don't even know if Borny still play. But they did this episode where they made rock soup, right? Now, I had some friends that would come over to my grandparents' house. I lived in like, we lived in a trailer in the back, in the backyard of my grandparents' house. So we would come over. I mean, my friends would come over. I had to be every bit of like six, seven, up in that age. And one day I was like, hey, do you know how to make rock soup to one of my friends? And she was like, no, but we went out and we scavenged for a rock. And at this age, my mama used to let me do little things in the kitchen. Like if I I had an easy bake oven, so she used to let me bake my easy bake oven. So I thought I could just go and bake on the stove or cook on the stove. So y'all, I kid you not. I go to my grandparents' house because I can just walk in and out of the house and I grab some potatoes and I think, I want to say I grabbed some carrots. I don't know. I had the bare minimum. Why did I go back to my house, put a pot on the stove, I put that rock in that pot, I put the potato in there and maybe some carrot, I don't know. And then I filled it up with water and I turned it on because we was about to make some rock soup. And my mama was like, uh what are you doing and I was like I'm making rock soup and I don't remember anything that happens after that but I think about that experience all the time because one my mama did not whip me for it because I I would have remembered that but I was just like wow like I really saw rock soup on Barney and I decided to go put a rock in a pot I just like, and I just knew that this soup was about to be on and popping. Like my mouth was watering. Like I was ready. And my friend, her name was, her name is Jessica. She was all for it too. Like she was like, okay, well, we're going to do this rock soup. Boop, 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 boop. And that's all I remember about the situation. But I think about that from time to time. Like, what was I thinking? What were both of us thinking? What were we thinking? Even though he was like five. <laughs> Well, you guys, I cannot wait to hear some of your stories. I just want to laugh with you at your funniest childhood memories. That is all that I have for you today. Make sure you join us again next week for another episode in the Childhood Trauma Series. We have two left, you guys. We have two left. We have two left. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you rate it. Leave us a review because I absolutely love reading y'all's reviews. They make me feel so happy. And follow us on Instagram at Affirmation of black girls and follow us on twitter at afdg underscore podcast thank y'all so much for listening and i will talk to y'all again next week Okay, y'all, I 
have a confession to make. I rarely buy big ticket items outright. I know what you're thinking, but no, I don't use my credit card all the time to do it. I use Affirm. Affirm lets you pay at your own pace and you always know exactly what you owe. I bought my West Elm couch using Affirm and I've been hooked literally ever since. Some of my favorite perks are that there are no interest fees on most purchases, very easy payments, you can even set up auto pay, and you get a fun congratulation text when you are done paying. And I absolutely love that and I be screenshotting it and sending it to my mama because I be feeling so accomplished. But sharing is caring, so I'm giving you $30 towards your first purchase using a firm. Use my code, which I have linked down in the show notes, to get started before September 5th, 2020. 22. Affirm, pay at your own pace.